effects of data mining in the higher education environment. Um, so yeah, when I was asked about what do I see as a primary blocker to the take up of TDM nationally and internationally, um, I found it quite difficult to think of one thing. So, um, but I, I sort of settled on the use and misuse of technology. So something I spoke about today was the mismatch between the fact that TDM is legal for non-commercial research, but so too at the moment is the application of technologies such as DRM and systems that monitor unusual activity. Um, so these are described as methods of protecting the security and stability of academic literature platforms. And I can see the the value, the value of the argument of that up until a point, but I do also see how these technologies can unreasonably restrict text and data mining, um, whether intentionally or not. And while this notion of sort of unreasonable limitations has yet to be actually defined in case law, as we've heard today, um, it does also mean that any text and data mining progress or uptake will only keep happening in fits and starts as these blocks keep happening. So for text and data mining adoption to truly take hold, restrictive technologies need to be radically phased out, quite frankly. Um, the negative attitudes that also sort of are behind them, so the fears of loss of sort of commercial gains, um, that also needs to change. And also publishers need to work on actually developing more open working methods with the research community to facilitate text and data mining in a productive way that sort of meet the needs of both parties. Really, and without that in place, with with that technology sort of still there, and also the lack of what people lack, lack of knowledge of what technology is available and how people can work with that, um, I don't think text and mining will ever be fully adopted until those things are addressed. Yes, that's my that's my piece. Ben, would you like to? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fine. So we're asking you know, Okay, is this being broadcast online by any chance, or can I speak no, candidly? Ah, oh, right, because <laughs> there's one major reason why. <laughs> but, um, I mean, in the library, our main problem with this kind of uh, area of work and the digital humanities in general is um, attracting and retaining suitably qualified staff. I mean, that's that's been a real issue, and it was. It was an issue when we ran our project, which initially was a two-year project, but we extended eventually. I think it ran to about four years because we had a lot of trouble recruiting someone. We had to get multiple rounds of recruitment before we got anyone. And then, um, you know, takes mine left during the course of the project. Um, and it was seen as such a dark art, you know, that the ability to kind of replace him on that crucial aspect um, was was pretty tricky. Now, subsequently, I mean, I noticed that things have moved along, and looking at you know the tools that are available online now, I mean, I reckon I could probably you know it's a bit of shell scripting, running a virtual machine, that kind of stuff. I think I can do that. Um, but I think when we initially did it, we did see that uh, we needed a very particular set of recondo skills. Um, now, libraries generally are moving. Uh, they have a better development base than they used to. I mean, certainly in Cambridge, we now have more developers available, and I think you know this is certainly within their skill set. So, I imagine if we were to run a project uh, today, we would probably not recruit externally. We would do it internally, and uh, we would just expect our development staff to uh, you know acquire the necessary skills in a comparatively short amount of time, by the looks of it. Um, but that's the main problem. And uh, it affects every technical project that we run in the UL uh, and libraries in general because we can't compete um, in many cases. Obviously, financially, it's very difficult to uh, compete uh, with uh, the, you know, the opportunities that are open for development stuff elsewhere. But also in terms of interest, it's rare that we find someone, I think we were very fortunate when we got our text miner, that he had a, an interest in the um, application of technology to humanities. But I think that's not that common. And I think um, we're lucky in that the developers that we still have working in the field of digital humanities in the library are people like that as well. And that's why they stayed, because I'm sure they could, they could have much better opportunities elsewhere. But I think they found, find the work stimulating. So I think that's the other issue as well, is that we have to perhaps make the work more interesting and not expect them just to you know, sit there and basically be a computer themselves. I think engage them in the value of the project, make them a stakeholder in it. And I think that's the advantage of this kind of discrete project. Um, way of doing things that we did, that you know, our text miner was very much invested in the results of what we did. So far, we seem to be having that's the second, you know, sort of comment about staffing. We've also got money, um, we've got policy so far in terms of getting. 
Wonderful. Well, I mean, we sort of put out an 80-page report or so on the barriers to text and data mining in Europe, so I could speak all day about this. But um, I think we broke it down into three main areas, and one of these was fragmentation. So fragmentation of resources, of knowledge, split across lots of different areas, lots of different people, different laws applying to different countries in the EU. This is a major problem. Um, one of the other aspects we looked at was restrictiveness, so when it comes to being able to actually genuinely reuse content, whether for technical reasons or for legal reasons, it's actually quite difficult to reuse the content. And then uncertainty is the third one. So um, I believe Danny asked the question, why is there not more TDM happening despite the fact that it's legal? And I think a large part of that is uncertainty and lack of awareness of what actually can be done under the law. And yeah, the distinction for non-commercial text and data mining is going to put off a lot of people, frankly. Uh, researchers doing basic research or very non-profit stuff in university may feel safe under this exception, but as soon as you get into the area of collaborations with industry, you get into grey areas, and I mean, especially in terms of things like if you want to mine the open web, it's impossible to do rights clearance. There are some TDM activities where you can have huge benefits, but it's just not possible to get licences for all of the content. Uh, and so I think, yeah, one of the recommendations this project has found is that in order to really recognise the benefits or realise the benefits of text and data mining across Europe, um, any exception to copyright has to be broad and harmonised and very clear on exactly whom can be a beneficiary and exactly what kind of things they can do. And at the moment that's not the case. And so even though there is, in theory, a legal exception, it's not being taken full advantage of. Charles Matthews, various hats. I'm speaking now as a Wikimedian <clears throat> and I thought I'd quote a small part of a report I was involved in drafting to the House of Lords in 2014 to the Digital Skills Committee there. <clears throat> so this is verbatim, and it supports very much what Georgina said. Technical barriers prevent innovation collaboration, reduce access to materials, and restrict the vast potential innovations in areas such as data mining. Our volunteers regularly attempt to mine data sources on the internet, the contents of which are freely licensed or entirely in the public domain, only to find that technical measures have been put in place to prevent or hinder automated access. <clears throat> publicly funded educational institutions and those that have received government or EU grants to enable digitization of IT copyright, brackets public domain holdings, should be required to make such holdings available to the public via the internet free of charge and free of technical restrictions on downloading that go beyond restrictions to protect the servers. Innovation is being built on mining such data sources. While technical measures may have a practical justification we often find measures that have no apparent purpose other than to frustrate and hinder. And then skipping forward to two points on the law, legislation should not differentiate between commercial and non-commercial activities as such a differentiation is not proportional, proportionate in the public interest. We would like to see a repeal of the EU database directive. I'm Alison Omara Eves from the UCL Institute of Education and um, we're going to have a bit of a replication crisis here because I'm going to try to not replicate what other people have said <laughs> even though I echo what they're saying. Um, I come from a community of systematic reviewers. We've, we've turned towards text mining and data mining out of necessity because the burden's too big. But the biggest barriers we're actually seeing to introducing this in, within our community comes from systematic reviewers themselves. Partly awareness, they'll be surprised and didn't realise these technologies were available, so there's a bit of a job for us to do in terms of letting people know what's out there. But just generally buy-in, um, so seeing the value of it, there's concerns about what letting go of the control that we have over our scientific process, whether we might miss out on finding relevant information by trusting the machines. Um, I think there's a little bit of scepticism around things like artificial intelligence that filters through from scary movies about robots through into actually using it in scientific research. Um, there's also concerns about the black box issue, concerns about lack of off-the-shelf software, although that is improving. So NACTEM, for example, is starting to develop, and there's some other teams that are developing software that can just be used off the shelf, and some of them are open source and free. Um, so that side of it's improving. But there's the skills. A lot of people just feel that they don't have the skills to use the, the tools, and there's a bit of a concern that they might not use it correctly, and you know, so there's a bit of a barrier there because it is a scary technology that only computer scientists can master. And I guess the final one, um, 
is is around how the broader world will use and, and, and receive any products that we create that use text mining. So it, I was surprised the first time it was raised to me by, by a systematic reviewer, but it's actually kept coming up, is things like, will they be able to publish their systematic reviews in journals? Because the journals may not accept it because there's you can't explicitly say how the text mining methods um, identified the studies. There's, there's things that the algorithm does behind the scenes that the systematic reviewer won't be able to communicate to peer reviewers and journal editors. So there's concerns around how their research looks to the community. One thing I would say, though, is that our funders, perhaps unsurprisingly, have been very positive and receptive <laughs> towards this because they, they can see that they can get more bang for their buck. So there's a bit of a um, cultural change that needs to happen amongst some people within the systematic review community, and I suspect it's similar sort of cultural barriers in, in other applications of text and data mining. Thank you. I'm Yvonne Nobis from Cambridge. Um, I have an even worse problem than Alice because I could quite happily replicate what everybody else said. Um, talking from a librarianship perspective, I think one of the major problems we have is advocacy. Um, we know the value of text and data mining, or those of us who are engaged with it do. But we need to get that over to our users. Sometimes I think our users are aware that there are technological solutions to problems that they have. But they may not classify those as text and data mining problems. So we need to create, you know, have advocacy for that. And to actually say, you have a problem. We may have a solution to it. And we're the right people to come to. At the moment, people who are technically literate are quite often able to write code for themselves to do the things they want. But that's only a very small proportion of people who potentially have problems that text and data mining could solve. So we need to engage with those people. The other th issue, I think, is very much the legal one. It's to do with database rights. It's to do with the copyright exemption. There are huge problems there. The problems there in terms of licensing, the problems in terms of what people are allowed to do. We know of people who've quite innocently um, conducted text and data mining activity and have found themselves through no faults of their own actually, you know, having their institutions cut off and they felt responsible for it. And that is an issue and we need to address it. And at university level, that has to be addressed. But also, I think, at a national level, because at the moment, much as Georgina was saying as well, many of the safeguards publishers have for themselves, which I can quite understand, having, you know, been involved in the past where people have been trying to download massive databases illegally. But the safeguards they have to stop that sort of activity are also stopping legitimate text and data mining activity. So I think that's where I am. Anybody like the microphone back? Well, I'm going to have to pass it on to other people. Okay, thank you very much. So we have had a one question through Twitter, but what, what um, comments or questions might come from the floor? Is anybody interested in contributing to this, having been inspired by what we've just heard? Oh. So you're not sitting with everybody. I'm, I'm sitting in the wrong place. I've, I've confused the system. Um, so I'm the, the final final roundtable person. Yes. Okay. Um, so if you didn't hear me before, I'm Rosemary Dickin, and I'm an editorial manager for PLOS, which is an open access publisher of biolog biological and medical research. Um, so from an OA publisher's perspective, it's unsurprising that I would see access and licensing as a primary blocker. Um, I'm going to take a lead from one of my editors, Lars Yule Jensen, who gave a, a talk to a group of publishers about what he needs. Um, and he said, as a researcher doing text mining, he needs the text. He doesn't want much else. The format doesn't matter too much. And if he can get it in a convenient format, that's great. And the license has to be reasonable. But I would see that as a bare minimum. Um, I think we can do a lot better. Uh, at a minimum, research should be freely available to those who wish to read and mine it. Um, but I think we should be able to provide text and metadata from across journals and across publishers in a standard format uh, that can be accessed, stored, analysed and reused without the need to pay or sign agreements. Um, if publishers can provide content in a format that makes it easier to use, that's great. Um, but if it can be in one place, that's even better. Um, and let's make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel at each organization or each company. Um, standards and centralized bodies can make this a lot easier, and we're really looking to the community to direct our next steps on this. 
Okay, so that's another, like Peter, sort of call to arms about the community working together. So does anybody want to comment on that, on who they think should be doing that, pulling things together, or where they think that that should be? Out? Yeah? <laughs> um, last year I went to some event, I think it was Alps, and I met somebody from the Copyright Clearance Centre. And now I can see Peter now. But this is exactly... <laughs> but they were very cautious about any reuse material. And I, I, I would be very worried about a publisher-led initiative in this space that restricted the legal rights of researchers to provide text and data mining. And that's not an anti-publisher statement. I think that would actually be damaging to a whole variety of industries as well. And that's where I think it shouldn't come from. To meet these people, he, he was trying to justify at the time page colour page charges for digital. That's how we ended up having particularly. Very nice. No, 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 not all published. But it, it was just this issue. It, it was the colour page charge. And he said, well, the colour pixels charge more. I mean, I appreciate he was talking in jest, but it was quite difficult to keep one's cool in that situation. I'm being very lazy. I'm just sitting here with a mic. Um, sticking with the publisher theme from the librarian perspective, um, is there a... Now, this is a... Okay, so legally, people are allowed to use text and data mining on that content. We advocate for more people to do this. This leads to much increased usage of resources. Are we then concerned that... Publish say, look what great value you're getting from our resources. Perhaps you should pay an extra 10% because you're getting 15 to 20% more usage from our <laughs> content. Um, because I know a lot of our GIST deals, they're band-based, but there's also a GIST model for what is good value from a per-article download. So, um, you know, that's that's the... Text and data mining is great, but I, not me personally, but there is that worry is it, it could be used as another shoehorn for increased subscriptions in the future. <laughs> I'm just waiting to spill the water here. Um, it's not something I've really considered as a problem as such. I, I, I can quite understand where you're going with that, and that, yes, potentially that's something else to beat us around the head with. No, 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 but equally, I think with most publishers, we pay more than enough. And actually, if we look at um, download stats, for example, even if they're very high, what they don't tell us if it's one article that's been downloaded six million times. So I think if they wanted to start playing hardball in that respect, we could ask them for much better statistical use. And quite often, also with text and data mining, a lot of the material that is being text and data mined tends to be older material anyway. And in some cases, we have bought archives of older material. So that may mitigate it. But yes, it's something to bear in mind. No, I think it's a very good point. Good. We'll hand over that. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure that I, I, I feel being very suitable individual to, to talk about it because I'm uh, frankly I don't know that much uh, about the topic as many of the people who are sitting in this square do. Uh, but it seems it seems to me from from what I can comprehend that this is a very powerful uh, tool for searching information and. Uh, because of that, and because of that, we saw many examples that gained quite a lot of publicity of how it was used commercially or in commercial world to great effect. Uh, I think it's also quite uh, crucial that it stay that it also is available to general to the public, to general population. And in that sense, the question that was asked, I think, 
uh, I mean, I think libraries are just fantastically positioned, also university libraries, to lead the effort, uh, you know, in my, in, to my mind, of having those tools being available and uh, having uh, and giving it access to other people because they are publicly funded bodies. And obviously that, you know, to, with, with that commitments, I, I can imagine, you know, it also better than me, it's funding needs to follow that to make that possible. But just because of how, you know, how, how crucial this tool is, how, how powerful that tool is. And I think it's, you know, it's just valuable per se that it is, it is available to, to anyone who would, you know, any researcher and not only those who can afford it. I think it's quite fantastic idea that, you know, this, this symposium already is positioning libraries at the center of it. I think it's quite, yeah, it's quite interesting approach. Uh, yes, yeah, so first a comment on what we heard about paying extra for text and data mining. This seems to me to be uh, a very bad way to go at the moment. Um, not only do we pay too much for our stuff, but this is a windfall for the publishers. Publishers do not do anything to increase the value of stuff being mined. It's a windfall. It's rather as if you had a, a house in the middle of nowhere uh, in a whole lot of horrible um, uh, factories around. They knocked them down. So you said, well, we double the rent because you've got a great future now. It's that sort of level uh, of things. Um, I also think it's extremely dangerous to go anywhere near publisher-centric solutions such as Copyright Clearance Center, which is basically a rent-seeking monopoly. You've got to remember, it's a monopoly. The easiest way to solve this problem is to say to the publishers, charge us whatever you like and give us access to whatever you feel you can do for the uh, price. And unless we challenge it, that is what is going to happen. They have to be uh, challenged on that. So that was picking that one up. Oh, because we'll take one from Twitter. So the question from Twitter, just to, this is the thing, a lot of these questions are around for the library community, is um, to what extent do or should libraries push back against or even query unfavorable uh, text and data mining license clauses? Anybody want to take that one, Georgina? <laughs> okay, so the would and should in that question is interesting. Um, I think we should, definitely. Um, but one thing, well, I say one thing as if it's a tiny thing, I think a very big part of that pushback is having either the legal knowledge ourselves or the support of legal people who do know this stuff very well. I mean, we do have a legal team here at the university that handle many different things, and I know that we do have somebody responsible for copyright. Um, but I have no idea if that team is remotely set up to be able to actually take on very large publishers in what would be quite a potentially complicated legal battle over the wording over one sentence. But I do think we should. I think as librarians and just as human beings, we are ethically obligated to actually counteract this stuff. See, I, I just need a little soapbox right now. <laughs> but, but we, I do feel very strongly about this. And you know, I, think, I think I said this to somebody on Twitter the other day. We were talking about, is it possible to be a librarian and not support open access? As far as I'm concerned, if we're not doing everything we possibly can to allow people access to the knowledge that they have every right to access, then we may as well go home. We're completely failing at the most fundamental purpose of being librarians. And I feel very strongly about that, obviously. <laughs> and you know, people may well disagree with me, and that's totally fine. That's all part of a discussion. But we should definitely fight against these, against these things and have those conversations and develop licenses that better reflect what we need. There are some licenses out there. There are some wording out on different publishers' websites that don't mention text and data mining at all. Why is that? It's madness. I mean, the, the fact that there are people out there not remotely even mentioning that this is a thing that exists just shows how short-sighted some publishers are. And the fact that they're not being open and transparent about what their views are and what they allow or don't allow. It's not fair on researchers who are trying to do something they're legally able to do to not have that full knowledge and not have that full information from 
the publishers as to what is actually going to happen if they do try to attempt text and data mining on their resources. So yes, we should very much so combat against all those things. I could just add one line. Yes, um, there was a comment that came out of the, the Libra conference last week, which was that if libraries were invented today, they'd be seen as a very radical institution. I mean, free knowledge for everyone yeah. <laughs> who'd get behind that. So yeah, I think it's a question of what is the role of a library in society and in the, in the um, landscape of research in general. And if it is to support researchers and to support access to knowledge, then I do think libraries have a very strong role to play to understand what researchers' needs are, what their rights are, to make sure that you're helping them be aware of those rights and supporting them in meeting those needs. Another thing to add, I know I've just spoken a lot about researchers and the access to that, and, and so as been already mentioned, I think that should extend to the public as well. Citizen science being a huge thing, how are people able to actually be able to contribute to the betterment of humanity if they don't have access to everything that they need to be able to do that? And it is not just researchers who can code. There are people out there doing this work for free because they fancy it, because it's something they're interested in. The entire Wikipedia community, you know, there's a lot of people out there doing this stuff with absolutely no institutional support. So great, if you are in a privileged position that you have a university that subscribes to stuff that you can legally access, that's brilliant. But if you're not, because you don't have that institutional association, or if you're in a country that simply is not able to buy access to all that kind of, you know, all those resources, all that literature, all of the knowledge that's out there, this stuff needs to be expanded further, but I realise the first challenge is addressing it for the university community. But you know, the ethics are still there, the ideas are still there, and I think librarianship as a wider um, profession should be campaigning for all of this stuff on a daily basis. So um, I think it's important to remember that the copyright exception contains a clause that says it cannot be overridden by contract. Uh, and what that means is, uh, even if you sign a license that has got a, a clause in it that says you can't do any text mining or constrains it, then that can't be upheld. And so it's up to the publishers then to say, to, to you know, Explain to you and say, well, just a minute. But then you say, here's the letter of the law. Deal with it. So, I mean, I think we have to be uh, proactive, uh, certainly, in noticing licenses that have these uh, restrictions in them. Um, also, remembering, though, that um, um, unless we're dealing with uh, something like Nestle licenses or something like that, that um, this may be a license that is on a publisher's website and is being consulted by institutions around the world, right? So it could be a, it could be a license for global purposes, right? So we have to be aware of that. But we say, because we're in the UK, we can ignore these um, restrictions. Very important to remember that. Um, license. But the license, uh, if the license allows you to do it, even if you sign something after that saying that you will do something restrictive with it, and, and we've had these ones. We've had a license where we, um, with one of the publishers, where a student wanted to uh, do some text and data mining, and they said, that's fine, we can provide it to you on a hard drive, a physical hard drive that we weren't allowed to put on a server anywhere, that we could pay them a thousand pounds for the physical hard drive for this one copy, and we said no, because the license would, would one, suppose supposedly hold up the whole university to ransom, not just the one student. And secondly, it was stupid. Um, so we, <laughs> so <laughs> we, got, we sort of changed it all. But are you saying that that would not, it wouldn't have any validity? Um, it's a slight, uh, that's a slightly, uh, Peter, do you want to answer that? Yeah. I, I, I've spent five years on this, and particularly my colleague, uh, Professor Charles Oppenheim, who's well known to many of you. And the position is absolutely clear. The law says, uh, that whatever is written in the contract, um, the law overrides it. So in other words, you can ignore what is written in the contract. The trouble is that the contract is between the university and the publisher and not between Peter Murray Rust and the publisher. So if Peter Murray Rust says this is unjust and the university says, well, tough luck, we could side with the publisher. There's nothing that I can do as an individual. And that's where the problem comes until universities start 
A, knowing the law, and B, asserting it. Researchers will be a you know, disadvantaged clientele. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Oh, okay. okay. Um, yeah, I was going to say the letter of the law is that um, if they impose something like an unjust or unreasonable technical protection or restriction on you, then that is unenforceable. Um, the, yeah, publishers or content owners are limited to reasonable technical protection measures and only reasonable te technical protection measures. And as long as you have legal access, then any other terms of the license which restrict what you want to do with text and data mining are unenforceable under the law. From experience of being barred by a publisher, um, <laughs> the way the usual way in which it's happened for me—I don't know if this is the case for everyone else—but it was a case of you download lots of papers, the publisher you, you've exceeded their rate limit, so they bar your IP address. Which, of course, if you're, for example, in a in a workplace, your IP address is shared among many many workstations in your in your work address. So effectively, they've banned 100, 200 people from accessing uh, their website. I think instantly, the, the suddenly someone someone somewhere in the university library gets a very angry email from the journal saying someone at this IP address has started downloading a huge amount of papers. We need to know what's going on. And that was my particular thing. Is I then got this very threatening email that said, "You have broken the law. You need to you need to explain exactly what's going on. You cannot use this ever again." Um, and as a result, we don't actually communicate with that journal anymore. But it's. Yeah, it, it kind of comes. It's, it's scare tactics in in the in immediate sense, and I think mm. it needs to be the understanding of how. Yeah, how do we fight that? How do we say, saying, "Well, hang on, they haven't broken the law. Um, you've restricted us from doing something that we we should be allowed to do." Uh, so yeah, that's just my personal viewpoint. It's really horrible when it happens. You know, it hits you here. It is a disgusting insult from the public. They call you a thief. Some. Uh, some licenses also say things like, you must tell us what your research project is, yeah. and we must approve it. Well, no, yeah. no, <laughs> no. Need to tell them. I would have a hard job telling them what my research yeah. project is. You know, National Centre for Text Mining Services to the community. Uh, when do we stop? <laughs> Question to those people who've been banned or barred from publishers. When that sort of thing has happened, have you had any support from anybody? Or have you just gone away and said, OK, it's, it's more hassle than it's worth? Because I would imagine this is duplicated across the whole of the UK, at least, in every academic institution, at least you know, two, three times a year, that there are people who are being barred from accessing research quite legitimately. And I would imagine you're one individual, you get a lawyer's letter or something pertaining to be a solicitor's letter. That's usually quite enough to make people stop what they're doing, not to turn around and say, well, actually, I'm going to fight this on principle. I'd actually be interested to find out if anybody knew of cases where people had actually you know, taken this further as well. So yeah, as, so as Peter said, it kind of hits you instantly. You know, um, I don't want to say I was like just following orders, but you know, I'm working on a project that is outlined well in, my, in yeah. like, for example, my PhD proposal and things like this. Um, and you you start doing something that you don't you don't see a problem and the the main the main issue you get instantly is okay you you've you've broken the law and that's it you're you're suddenly very you, you get very defensive and the support I got in the in the, in the initial instance was actually it almost felt like the response I got almost from the university in an extent to an extent was what have you done why have you done this yeah. Exactly. You know, you, you, you've caused us a lot of trouble, and I yeah. felt instantly like I was causing a lot of people a lot of hassle. Um, uh, thankfully, you know, support of well, Peter, for example, and and uh, my supervisor and our department, who kind of said, "Hang on, this is a this is a tool that actually." Part of the funny thing about this tool is that the tool I use to to retrieve data is actually published in the journal that barred me from <laughs> using it. So it's kind. Of, it, it makes absolutely no sense. So thankfully, the support was there, and in the end, we resolved the issue. But um, so yeah, there isn't there is support there in the end. But in the in the initial instance, it's kind of you know um, everyone's up in arms and thinking, what have you done? You've you've caused a real a real problem.
There's just an aspect of being used to dealing with it. Um, I'd previously worked for a publisher where we'd get cut off once a month, once every two months, <laughs> because, you know, 500 publishing editors accessing, as I said this morning, accessing all the journals um, for perfectly legitimate pe purposes, um, mm. would just occasionally flip their trigger for however much data load was considered inappropriate. And, you know, someone would have to send an email or phone someone and sort it out. But it was a common occurrence and people got used to dealing with it. Whereas I suppose if you're a library or an individual PhD researcher and you get hit with some scary message saying, you know, well, you're a thief, essentially, mm -hmm. or literally in some cases, yeah. then, yeah. Yeah. I think it is very much that difference of it being the individual as opposed to the institution. So I have dealt with in the past certain things like this where, you know, access has been cut off for whatever reason and I do I do have a real problem with the assumption or that there is guilt that someone has done this maliciously um, rather than doing something legally or in some of the cases I've dealt with somebody just being a little bit over enthusiastic and downloading quite a lot of stuff at one go and going oh great this is amazing I'm gonna download all these papers and then keep them for you know a rainy day or whatever um, and yeah I think what you said about the sort of the the fact that you know, you sort of feel like you're almost causing causing people problems and things like that. I mean, on one hand, it's an inconvenience that that sometimes you know large proportions of you know universities are cut off from various things because you know access has been denied to a certain IP address. However, it's however it's particularly um, played out. But at the same time, this stuff does happen. Things go down all the time for a variety of different reasons, and I think to make anyone, you know, intended or otherwise, to make anyone feel like they're causing a bother or they're causing a problem through doing something legitimate is terrible. <laughs> and I can only apologise that you made to feel like that, but I do know that it's not uncommon, your experience. Um, and yeah, I do think something needs to change with the, the, the way in which the response is handled, whether by the university or by the publishers, how, you know, wherever it's coming from, the assumption that you are doing something deliberately illegal. Often it's not even illegal, but doing it in that way, I think, is a very unhelpful response. And it means that we don't get past that, oh, you've done a bad thing, therefore we're cutting you off, as opposed to, OK, this thing's happened. Let's work with you to actually try and find a solution so it doesn't happen again, or that so we can facilitate what you're actually trying to do, rather than just, that's it, you're banned for life. Good luck with your research. <laughs> See you later. You know, it's, 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 it's a problem. So very quickly, part of the problem is that there are actually people on the publisher side who deliberately human use aggressive language against mm. researchers. There is a policy of chilling people. That's a, the word, legal word. It means frightening the hell out of them, right, uh, for doing this. Now, I have spent a lot of time standing on the floor of meetings uh, engaging with Elsevier, Wiley, American Chemical Society. And you get nowhere. You're dealing with middle management. The only thing that is going to change this is letters from the people who buy the journals uh, to the legal department of the publisher saying we've had enough of it. Dealing with this at a person-to-person -person level simply lets them get away with it. You know, how many publishers have suffered by cutting people off? None. How many researchers have suffered? I've seen people reduced to tears by this, right? Um, and it's totally unacceptable. The institutions have got to get together and tell the publishers enough. I want to say a couple of things. One is um, I can't obviously answer for the publishers, but I work at the um, point at the UL where these messages come when publishers cut us off. And um, I just want to clarify one point, which is that the UL can't contact any researcher itself. Um, the procedure is that it has to go to the department college um, of the individual. So it seems to me that perhaps an action to come out of today is to um, Touch with the UIS, um, which is I don't know what the what the infrastructure is there in the university, but I, I assume that there's some means of of um, nation of IT offices in the colleges and departments of faculties. Whoever is doing that contacting, because it's it's just to be clear, it's not the university library. The university library deals with the problem, but then it can't interact with with you. It's done by the university and the department. So. 
they need to do a much better job, obviously, of, of managing that communication. The other thing I just want to say is that we deal with the licenses for um, mostly publisher um, mainstream journal licenses like and I think Danny's probably working on this at a higher national level, but today the reality is that, that um, these publishers can cut us off, as, as you've described. Um, what I think we would like to do is not to receive these messages from publishers telling us that this has happened, but instead to anticipate the problem. I'm sure that there is a massive, potentially massive overhead in terms of staff resource here. But, um, very early days, it would be interesting at the very least to see whether instead we could contact the publisher ahead of the TDM activity and say, we want to do this on your content, not cut us off. I do appreciate that there are other efforts that are working at a much better solution, an automated solution. Out subset of content which may not be relevant to you even. we have that right in law seems to me something that we could try and just on another point of detail we are um, example in fact with Elsevier of listing their imposition of um, in the license to make TDM more difficult well, there have experience have listed it in Water since so much time, sorry. <laughs> I'm very difficult to speak, I'm very dehydrated. So, can I just add on that point? As an evil publisher, Ted and Francis, <laughs> I'm worried about to put my head above the parapet here, but um, I hear a lot of what's going on. I think we do have to make it more transparent what we allow for our publisher. Now, I know our license should. University of Cambridge say basically just let us know and we'll let you do it. That's, you know, with, if any of those from us, it's just because we don't know. We don't try and block. We do try and say if you want to text mine, just tell us so that we can prime our servers to expect it. And off you go. So, and I don't know if that's true of all publishers, but it sounds a bit not. Yeah, but, th but that's really what it could. So some of this is accidental. Some of the language then becomes because it goes to legal departments who are so far away from salespeople. Etc. who deal with being sort of your legal departments are so far away from you and it becomes the will you wave in between lawyers at some point, uh, which is what we get into. So, um, so if we can avoid that by just letting us know, and I know we get very few requests because I went to check before I came here what the position was, we get very few requests, which for us interpret, can be interpreted as does not, not demand or people aren't aware. It's probably perhaps somewhere in between there. We need to make it more aware and I think I'm going to go back and talk to my colleagues and say how can we make it make things more aware to everyone that we don't want to block this. We see the value in it for everyone. Um, but please work with us. If you're using Taylor and Francis journals, let us know. And we'll try to stop it. We'll try not to stop it. Try to stop the, <laughs> try to stop the notices. <laughs> so, okay. Um, it's, I'm sure that 10, 15 years ago when um, things like electronic journals became available and then e-books, librarians are having the same similar questions. It seems that there's a kind of bigger situation going on here is that publishing, making things available digitally, there's lots of advantages for publishers, but there's also lots of advantages for users. And I think there's a bit of naivety in, well, you know, you make something available electronically and, and what's possible then is then to, to be surprised and be restrictive about what all the other things that people can do with that um, digitally available context, so maybe we need to kind of stop this similar situation happening in five, ten years' time when something else is possible uh, because content's available digitally and, and people need to read. If you're going to make things available digitally, then you have to be aware that people will do all kinds of things with that. And so you can't kind of make things available digitally and reap all the benefits of that and then also at the same time go, oh, actually, we're not going to allow you to do things like text and data mining, well, it's like such an obvious thing, you know, like, well, you know, if it's available electro electronically, why would people not want to do that? And I'm sure, I'm sure publishers and people making this content just need to be a little bit less disingenuous about what is then possible with that content.
Um, I was just, I've heard this from publishers as well, um, saying, well, to a PhD student, well, just let us know before you do something. But I wanted to ask PhD students or anyone who does use TDM, how practical is that? You know, I, and do you have to tell them when you're going to be doing this? You could be working in the lab at 10 o'clock at night before that particular instance of text data mining. That's not going to be practical. But I just wanted to know what other people thought. Sorry, a lot of work goes on before press the button that goes text data mine. So at some point, you might have a knowledge of when you're going to press the button to get it shuttling through the algorithms. I'm not a researcher in that thing. I mean, yeah, we can try to anticipate what people want to do with content, but you guys are at the forefront of what's been done in the world, and we're quite a few ways back. So yeah, we want, we want to work together. Certainly my company does. Um, I don't know whether the best mechanism is through the, the library, and the library contacts us. I, I, mechanisms are always a the difficulty of the process, but I'm sure we can find them. If the research, you don't just wake up one day and go, you know, I'm going to text data mine that. There's planning that goes into any research project. Getting the question ready, what do you want to know? What? So um, at some point, even if it's three months ahead of the line, that, that we're aware. And we, we shouldn't want to know what all the, it's for, because that content's there to be mined. I mean, if people are asking that, I don't know who they are, but I, I would hope my company wouldn't, and we weren't. Um, but I'm can imagine some do. So. I'd just like to reply to some of the comments raised. I mean, I think in an ideal world, it'd be brilliant if people could say, yes, I'm interested in text and data mining this data set. But I think you hit two problems there. First, a lot of the stuff that people are doing, they may not be aware that it's called text and data mining. So, for example, in the past, I used to download loads of cases from a particular legal database. Now, what I was doing is theoretically text and data mining, but at that point, I knew once I hit 1,000 articles, then I'd be stopped. So I made sure I limited my searches to 999 articles together. But it's, you, you don't, I would never call that text and data mining. There are other people who will be doing very similar activity, where they'll be looking for a string of words across a wide variety of data sets, and it will never cross their mind that they're doing something that potentially could hit a tripwire. So I think that's one problem, sort of advocacy about what text and data mining is. And secondly, I think there's a problem in terms of the fact that if you're looking at, say, an institution the size of Cambridge or any other institution, the staffing structure for people like James to, to actually be able to handle X many requests from X many different researchers, and also the nature of research is you're changing your mind as you're going along. You're looking at one data set, you're looking at another data set you know, perhaps running identical searches. And I just see the publisher perspective as well, but I don't think it's actually a practical solution. I don't think universities in particular are funded at that level to be able to do that sort of thing. If we were, but we're not. <laughs> yeah, and direct answer to the question about how we, how we sort of currently do it and whether or not it's practical to just sort of notify everyone in advance. It really depends on the project in, in, the, in the first stage, because it's quite possible that people are working on sort of live, online, constantly mining new information, in which case you want to run your analysis for weeks, days, months. It could be, you know, you could, you could, without any real trouble, run some of these bits of code for, you know, several months and see what you get out at the end. And it's like, if you went to the publisher in the, in the first instance and said, oh, we're going to run this for six months, um, is that okay? I, I, I doubt you're going to get a, a positive response on that. Um, but, but of course, I, I just want to sort of add as well that I, I don't think there's, a, there's an issue, I don't think any of us have said this, but I want to just highlight the point. I don't think there's an issue with the kind of rate limit thing in the sense that it's not unreasonable for us to not crash publishers' uh, servers. That, that's completely uh, reasonable. I just think that the the diversity and certainly what I've experienced with the different publishers is that some of them are as slow as one a minute, um, which at that point you're not you're not data mining. You might as well just click them yourself um, <laughs> because that is quicker. So um, I think that needs to be looked at as what is an acceptable rate limit for everybody involved and whether that, I mean, obviously some every publisher's server is going to be different. They're not going to be able to access, have the same access rate or um, at different times of the day, the access rate is going gonna, is gonna to change, but um, I don't know how best to deal with that.
when in response to some of the things that have been said in terms of like the practicality of informing people. Thanks. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, in terms of the practicality of informing publishers before you mine their content, I think Martin said, um, you don't just wake up in the morning and decide you're going to do it. That's actually, I'm sorry, but that is actually sort of a misconception. I, I have done that. And um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, um, it doesn't seem practical to go through the process of telling the library that I'm going to do something and then the library telling somebody else, you know, every single time. That's, I'm sorry. I think the language, totally agree. I think I've worked in plenty of areas where different things mean, the same thing means different things. You see what I mean? Same words. And I think trying to find a common language as to what people are doing, that's going to be a challenge. We're behind the curve on this. I mean, we're going to of necessity going to be behind the curve on what we hear about because what goes on in a, a research lab or an office takes time to permeate up to the libraries. The libraries interact with publishers at the sales level, it takes time to get from the sales department, the editorial department, the marketing department, the legal department. That takes time, and, and a lot of this is just a permeation. Um, I don't think the majority of people in the publishers want to try and stop it, block it. It's, it's, I mean, I, I, IP addresses, I'm still amazed that IP addresses is used as the means of access in, in a modern world, to be honest. But um, that's another issue that, that's beyond that. But I think it's, it's trying to get the dialogue going effectively. And I, I totally understand where Peter's coming from in a lot of his skepticism, because I do acknowledge some people in my industry are yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but it's trying to get that, that dialogue going, find the appropriate mechanisms that, okay, if you do wake up in the morning, you do it, fine. Uh, but that we respond in a way and we're trying to make it as transparent as we can, where we can. I don't know if my company puts something transparent on our websites, even or on every article or what have you. I think we need to look at that so that people can find, find this information. Um, obviously, there's a UK legal exception to the rest of the world. So there's, there's, we've got to, we operate in many different copyright environments as well, so trying to get that message over to everyone and, uh, and what have you is, is a difficulty as well. So, but it, it's just trying to find the right message to the right people at the right time, which is what someone talked about, and they text money actually. So, um, but that, that's difficult. We, we don't want to obstruct, by the way. Yeah. Yes, the IT support officers, all that police. That all takes a lot of time for us. If I, would, I would think that that would take a lot more time than saying, this IP wants to do this text mining, keep it open for three, four, five. Need to renew it after that period. What I'm hearing, and I might be not, this, this might not be what other people are hearing, but I'm hearing that what we really, we're talking about mechanism now. That what we've ended up talking about, we started talking about difficulties with staffing and talk about issues to do with the universities getting its act together or the country getting its act together. And um, we discussed the sort of problems with the publishers and all the X, Y and Z. But actually what we've ended up talking about is what is the process here? And that's complicated. And I think that, that, I mean, it's not something we're going to solve today, but there are a couple of sort of solutions that have been put up by different people and others have said, well, that's not going to work for me. But I think that that probably is the next conversation we might really need to be having. On a practical level, how can this work? Um, and I'm not quite sure how we have that conversation, but I think that that is a, because we need to find a solution. Because everyone's saying, well, how about you do this? Well, that's not going to work for X and well, no, I only want you to do Y. That's not going to work for us. But if we can find examples of things that do work, perhaps that's a good start. I don't know. Um, we are out of time, but that does not mean that the conversation has to stop because we do have nice summer drinks downstairs, um, but you will not be allowed out the door. We are locking the door until you um, complete your, your feedback make, uh, form because that's, but that helps us make decisions about how, how we can continue this conversation to try and really affect some change. So while, while you are all in the room, I would like to thank everybody so much for coming along and participating. I think this was, was a, a really good opportunity for us to get together and discuss all these um, activities. We have recorded at least half of what went on, and we'll be making that online, and some of it you can hear. Um, so thanks very much for coming, and we'll meet you downstairs.